everyone. I'm Emma Varva Lucas, Executive Director of the Progress Network. We're gathering constructive public voices to see what progress we can make together. You can find out more about us at theprogressnetwork.org. And one of these voices is Tina Rosenberg. She's a longtime journalist and author, a Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award winner. So it's a fancy way of saying she is very cool. Um, you might have seen her work in a number of different outlets, but one place you can definitely find her is the Fixes column in the New York Times. And she's also the co-founder of the Solutions Journalism Network, which trains journalists to approach their work in a new way. And that's what we're going to talk to her about today. So welcome, Tina. It's a pleasure to be here, Emma. Thank you. Yeah. So when I say solutions journalism, um, I'd hazard a guess that a lot of people don't know what that means, especially if they associate journalism these days with like angry TV pundits. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> let's start at square one. What, what is solutions journalism? Solutions journalism is journalism that reports on efforts to solve problems as well as the problems themselves. And it does that not as advocacy, not as saying, here's how to solve the problem, not as cheerleading, not as public relations or fluff or good news, but it looks at what's going on to try to solve the problem and how well are they doing? What's the response they're getting? What does the data say about what works and what doesn't work about it? So it's reporting on solutions just like it, with the same standards you use to report on problems. I mean, do you see a lot of this in the news already, or is this sort of a new concept? It's not a new concept at all. Um, I think people have been doing this for a long time without putting a name to it. I think that because of the Solutions Journalism Network, which started in 2013, there's now a name and a system mm -hmm. for doing it and teaching materials. And it's really taken off. Um, I mean, our job is to go into newsrooms and work with individual journalists also to show them how to do this and why they should, what are the advantages. But um, one way we know this is that we collect solutions journalism done by our partners and done by anyone in our solution story tracker that anybody can go to and look up different you know, topics or what's going on in my area or we now have, we just hit 10,000 stories in our story tracker. So that's, that's a big deal for us. That's huge. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, we work with hundreds of newsrooms around the United States and around the world. There's a lot of demand for this. So we know this is definitely a growing thing. Um, and so if this isn't a, a new concept, uh, what led to the founding of Solutions Journalism Network? I mean, why did you guys decide to come together and say, okay, I think this needs an organization? That's a good question. Um, it came out of the column that you mentioned, the Fixes column in the New York Times, that um, my co-founder, David Bornstein, and I um, wrote regularly, and our third co-founder, Courtney Martin, wrote for occasionally. And we've been doing that since 2010. And that's every week a look at a response to a problem anywhere, any subject. And after about two years, David thought, you know, we really need to spread this around because the idea of reporting on solutions is necessary to help journalism thrive and it's also necessary to help society thrive. And so we started this, this NGO, this non-governmental organization to work on spreading this. I mean, why is it so necessary? Where do I even start? <laughs> well, one reason that, um, let's talk about civic trust. Um, how do we know about people who don't look like us and aren't like us? We know about them through the media, right? That's where the word media comes from. It mediates our relationships. And what do we know about them? We know what the media reports. But when journalists go to a community that's historically marginalized in any way, our usual tendency is to look at it purely through the lens of stereotype. Um, if you look at, for example, the New York Times coverage of Brownsville, Brooklyn, all you see is gun violence, um, as if nothing else went on there. And so, of course, when New York Times readers who don't live in Brownsville read about Brownsville, that's all we think goes on there. And communities hate that. They don't feel reflected or respected by the news, but it also makes the outside world look at those communities purely as felonious. One of the newsrooms we work with is in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And the first time I went there to work with them, I asked them, what do you guys think of mainstream media coverage of Alabama? What you see in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Evening News. And they said, we hate it. It's awful. <laughs> well, why? Because you always make us look like ignorant yahoos. 
Mm. And, and those stories are not inaccurate. They do things that make them look like ignorant yahoos, and the media reports on that. But it's very selective. They also do things that don't make them look like ignorant yahoos, and the media doesn't report on that. Mm. So, so we have a very distorted picture of what Alabama looks like. We go there and we look for the people with four teeth. So solutions journalism is an antidote to that. It, it's really a way to tell the whole story about a community. It's also a way to spread ideas. <coughs> Right now, with COVID, with the pandemic, every community in the world is facing the same problems. Why should we all have to reinvent the wheel? We should find out about what's working 50 miles down the road that we don't know about. And that's the role that journalism can play with solutions reporting. I mean, we've certainly seen a lot of discussion about people's distrust of the news. And I certainly you know, take your point that it, a part of it is because communities feel like they're not being... Uh, represented accurately. So that we're, that's right. we're hoping that solutions journalism will make people trust the news more. Is that, I mean, is that like a David and Goliath type situation? Or? No, that, that's, that actually does work very well. Um, and we, we have a lot of good evidence that that happens, that it just completely changes the relationship of a newspaper and its community. Um, I mean, we in the journalism world tend to think that if we do a, a really hard hitting investigative report, about something that's going on in a community that's, that's bad, which we should keep doing. I'm not saying we don't do those stories. We feel like we've done the community a great service. A lot of people in the community don't agree with that. Um, they don't see you as a, as a positive civic actor when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, they want us to show also what is going right in the community. And again, I'm not saying we shouldn't do those hard-hitting investigative reports, but we also need to show what is happening in the community that is working? What, what are people doing to solve their own problems? And that is something that helps people think of a newspaper as a valuable part of civic life. That builds trust. I mean, you definitely mentioned too that feeling of unbalance where people, you know, they wake up in the morning, they, you know, scroll through their phone or maybe they have the physical newspaper still and maybe they look Doing on scrolling. TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all, all you hear about is like problems, 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 problems. And you get this view of the world that, of course, there are a lot of problems going on, um, but there are a lot of things going right as well. So are we trying to, you know, get this a little bit more balanced? Yeah. I mean, we don't report on them because we don't define them as news. News to journalists is what's going wrong. And, and that just gives you a completely distorted view of the world. I mean, if the goal of journalism, the ultimate goal is to hold a mirror up to society, to accurately reflect society so society can improve, we're not doing that. We're holding up a funhouse mirror that only shows the bad stuff. Mm. Um, you know, and we mentioned that uh, the Solutions Journalism Network not only collects uh, solutions, journalism stories, but that you train journalists and you have, you know, certain... Uh, curriculum and so forth. I mean, what does that look like? What, what kind of training are these uh, journalists getting? Well, we have online um, and that's a lot of tools on our website. Like for example, interactive courses in basic solutions journalism in editing and doing engagement with the public around Sojo. Uh, we have um, toolkits for professors of journalism. We have resources for people who teach in universities, non-journalism classes but would like to use solutions journalism as curriculum. So we have a lot of online resources, but we also go into newsrooms physically and now mainly virtually to do workshops to help them understand how to do this with high standards um, and why they should do it, what the advantages are. And then we work with journalists who are doing specific projects and we do this all over the world. I mean, it's real hands-on training that is, it's very specific curriculum. It's easy to define, it's easy to grasp. And a lot of reporters we know are tired of writing only about bad stuff. Mm -hmm. they, don't like, they don't like writing about it any more than readers like reading about it. And we know that, that the negativity of the news is the number one reason people disengage. I mean, we are, we are losing our audience uh, if we cannot provide them with something to hold on to that makes them feel a little bit more powerful and hopeful. And they want to do these stories, but they're afraid to do them because they don't know how to do them with high standards. They're afraid mm. they'll come out looking like cheerleading or fluff. So mm. we teach them how to do that with high standards. 
Yeah. I mean, what's the nitty gritty of that just a little bit? I mean, most of the people watching are going to be journalists, but I am interested to hear about how you meet those high standards. So it's not like, you know, golden retriever hugs, small child. And, right. uh, you know, the, there's a knitting project, right. or, you know, what have right. you. <laughs> um, well, we have, there's four qualities that a solutions journalism story has, and we teach you how to do each of those qualities. And the first one is, it's about a response to a problem and how that response works. It's not about a person with good intentions. It's about the work that person is doing. Secondly, it looks at evidence of success, not just good intentions, but what do we know about how well this is working? And third of all, it's not just inspirational stories. It's not a story about the golden retriever. Um, it's, these stories have to be insightful. They have to show you important information that society needs. And the fourth quality is they must talk about what's not working. Mm. Nothing is a perfect solution. And you don't have any credibility if you say that they are. So you have to show in your story, here's where the challenges still lie. Here's what's not working about it. And you have to be cover it, the good and the bad. Do you have um, a couple examples of some really high standard solutions journalism stories that you have done recently or read recently? Oh my goodness, I can give you 10,000 of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly yeah. 10,000 of them. <laughs> yeah. um, 10,016, I think now, but um, All right. sure. I mean, a lot of, well, let me tell you about a, a series that had a huge impact. Um, Cleveland has a big problem with infant mortality. And the Plain Dealer, the newspaper there, which is now gutted, unfortunately, had done a couple of series that looked at infant mortality in Cleveland and about how bad the problem was, and, and they had not produced any real change. So um, we helped them do a solution series. They went to Baltimore, a city that's demographically very similar, but which has a very successful program to combat infant mortality. And, um, and they looked very in-depth at what Baltimore did and how they did it and what the results were they were getting, and they published stories about that. And then the Cleveland uh, City Task Force on Infant Mortality, which was formed but had no idea what to do, seized on this. And they said, well, let's do what Baltimore did. And they brought the Baltimore folks to Cleveland to talk to them, and they copied the program. And it's been hugely successful in Cleveland as well. And that's a great example. Yeah, I mean, this is what you're talking about with COVID, too, that we don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. And it's sort of like a de-siloing of solutions. Like, you know, if this is going to work in one city, why wouldn't it work in another? Right. Yeah, right. yeah I feel like I don't read stories like that a whole ton, I have to say. <laughs> no, um, but you read, probably read more of them than you used to. Yeah, Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that I do. And I think that I see um, this more often than it used to because I am a news junkie. I love the news. I am an yeah. avid uh, news consumer. Um, and I, I personally, I feel like I see this idea catching on. I mean, what, what about you? Is there a response to this that you've been able to see since 2013? Yeah, a phenomenal response. Um, I mean, one reason you don't see it is that it's not a way of doing journalism that applies in every situation. It's not for breaking news. It's not for um, things like um, political campaign. There's no like solution to Trump or solution to Biden. Um, it's for issues that are widely shared. When everybody has the same problem, or lots of people do, then they're going to be able to find solution stories because some of those responses are going to be more um, valuable and newsworthy than others, and you can report on them. Right. And as you mentioned about breaking news, like the timeline is just different. And this is what I tell people sometimes. Um, they look at me and they're like, well, you're in media. Like, What's going on with you guys? Um, what, do they look, mean, the, what do they mean by that, Emma? Well, that's a great question, what, what they mean by that. Um, I, <laughs> I think that there is a huge amount of distrust um, and that they feel like they can't trust what they're reading and they want to know why. Um, I don't think that I'm necessarily the person with the answers for that, mm -hmm. but, you know, or they want to, they want to know why they feel like the world is constantly going to hell in a handbasket, you know, regardless of what year we're in. I mean, 2020 is a particularly bad year, but, you know, even, even before then, I think people constantly felt like, uh, they were doom scrolling, you know, there were just yeah. dumpster fires everywhere. Um, and you know, one thing that I, I did try to bring out when I spoke to them was that 
there are people responding to problems all over the place. It's just that the timeline for that is different than breaking news. You're not going to have like breaking somebody, you know, right. has lowered the rate of infant mortality in Baltimore. You know, that's just not, right. that's not the way it works. And you, and you have to look for these things and not sort of be caught in the avalanche or the tsunami of the, the problems besetting us in breaking news. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and, you know, since we're, we're talking about this a little bit, um, do you have any advice for people? You know, they, most people watching this aren't going to be journalists. Um, you can definitely root on like, okay, this, the work you guys are doing is great. Um, we're hoping that journalists on the inside are also going to take this on. But what about if you're, if you're not in the industry, you're just reading the news as yeah. anyone does, what can they do to, to have a little bit of a healthier approach? Um, well, don't doom scroll for one thing. I mean, uh, I think if you want to, if you want to search out solution stories, which you might want to do that, the last thing you read every day before you put your phone away, go to the solution story tracker, click on a subject that interests you, whether it's race and policing or COVID or climate change, and see what's happening that's, 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 that's working. Um, the other thing you can do is encourage the news organizations that you do read to do more of this work. And the way to do that is, Read these stories, click on them, spend time with them, um, you know, subscribe right after reading them. News organizations pay attention to what people read right before they subscribe. Write them a letter saying, hey, really love this solutions journalism. I think that we really need that. It's funny. This is something that civilians, what I mean, non-journalists, get instantly. Of course that the news should have that. Journalists have a lot more trouble with that, with that idea. Um, and we need to hear it from, from our audiences. We need to hear it from our readers. Um, well, why do journalists have a little bit more trouble with that? Well, because for a long time we have defined news as what's going wrong. I think also because journalists have a tremendous fear of looking soft. It's so funny that the most fearless journalist who will hold the most powerful person to account can be terrified to do a solution story because they're afraid it'll come out looking like you've been snowed by your sources, you're naive. We're a cynical bunch. And that, inside our profession, that's the worst thing you can do. That's not the way the rest of the world sees it, but that's the way we see it. Um, and we have to realize that is not the way the rest of the world sees it. That our view of our profession, our view of what is news is not serving us as a profession and it is not serving society. I think that's a perfect uh, ending note. Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you. Bye.